Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to the Daniel Patrick O'Connor Lecture for 2015. I'm Bruce Coriel, one of the chaplains here at Colorado College, and it's my deep, deep honor to introduce Gary Snyder tonight. Um, just a little bit about the, the plan for the evening. Um, Gary's going to be speaking for a few minutes, and then, um, if we're lucky, I think he's going to read some of his new work, some of his new poetry. And there's a rumor that he might be willing to sign some books afterwards. I think they're trying to set up a table and do some things that way. So if you have some of his work with you, there might be that possibility at the end of the time together tonight. There'll also be a little bit of a time for a question and answer after the, after the talk and the readings. So I'd really like to um, start by extending a special invitation and greetings to the family of Dan O'Connor who join us tonight. And um, I remember Dan's passion and commitment, and this lectureship in his honor continues to be a gift um, that, like Dan, teaches us new ways to be human, to take responsibility for the earth and all of its inhabitants, as well as to find joy and beauty and friendship. So to family, I thank you so much, uh, and to the sociology department, uh, thank you for organizing this and letting me participate, um, and I thank you all for being here tonight. And I said earlier um, to some friends that Sometimes um, you have a favorite author or a hero and you meet them in person and are disappointed. Tonight will not be one of those nights. Um, so no one can do justice to another person's life or work in a brief intro before a talk. Given the great honor of introducing Gary Snyder, this seems even more true than ever to me. Be poet, deep ecologist, Buddhist practitioner, environmental activist, Philosopher of the wild, none of these titles are quite enough. Or maybe they're too much. I, for one, have long admired Gary's life and his work, and I think of him as working in the tradition of Dogen, a medieval Zen master who himself traveled the world to return to his home with a wisdom that was actually grounded in the local, everyday reality of the, the, of the home that he knew all along. Like Dogen, it seems, to me, it seems that Gary has lived his whole life between mountains and waters. Um, and Gary, by the way, um, Tava, the mountain are, that our Ute sisters and brothers called Sun Peak, um, we know it as Pikes Peak, welcomes you back to Colorado Springs um, and your home here. Um, so, what was I saying? Oh, yes. <laughs> More recently, I've become convinced that Gary Snyder may well be Dogen reincarnated and given to us for one more round until he finally ascends or he recommits yet again to bringing compassion to all sentient beings. So what do you offer in an introduction to one such as this? Perhaps some words from Dogen about mountains first. Although we say that mountains belong to the country, actually, they belong to those who love them. When the mountains love their master, the wise and the virtuous inevitably enter the mountains. And when sages and wild ones live in the mountains, because mountains belong to them, trees and rocks flourish and abound and the birds and the beasts take on a divine excellence. We should realize that mountains actually take delight in wise ones and sages. And finally, very humbly, I offer a personal blessing as a, from a fellow, a fellow lover of water. Blessings on the way. May the highest good be yours, and may you continue to be the highest good as you are. May, you can, uh, may your path be that of water, racing down the high mountain, traveling across the broad earth, frolicking in the deep ocean, soaring into the endless sky, and gently falling upon the rich land, and coming to an end, always finding the way to your true beginning. Please join me in welcoming Gary Snyder.
That's wonderful. Thank you. Uh, uh, and thanks uh, to the family of Daniel Patrick O'Connor again uh, for having made this possible. Um, and it was 17 years ago, 1996, uh, that I last was invited to be the Daniel Patrick O'Connor lecturer here. Uh, I couldn't believe it when I was asked again. <laughs> I must have done something wrong or right, I'm not sure which, uh, uh, to be remembered over that many years. Uh, but we had a wonderful chat over dinner tonight and uh, all of us are, um, including not only Detrick, uh, Daniel Patrick O'Connor's uh, son, uh, living son, and his family, but his almost grown grandchildren, all here. Uh, so the world moves on, uh, and what we have to figure out is what we're going to do with it, uh, or what it's going to do with us. Uh, a Dogen also is, uh, uh, of course, uh, a remarkable figure from 12th century Japan, about whom we will all be hearing more in the future, uh, since he's not only um, uh, a brilliant spiritual philosopher, uh, but also uh, he outguesses the deconstructionists and the postmodernists in his own way, and they can't deal with him. <laughs> you know, and so uh, uh, some of Dogen's writings have now been translated into uh, uh, not only English, but into French, uh, where they, they are scrambling around to refigure how they talk about things. Uh, so that's kind of fun. The plan for tonight, such as it is, this is a great new building. This wasn't here before. Uh, <laughs> uh, and I'm learning a lot more about Colorado Springs. I've been here about four times already, actually. Uh, uh, starting when I was, you know, a mere 30. Uh, uh, and for the first time, uh, got uh, taken through the, uh, uh, what is it, the Garden of the Gods up there. And my first thought was, because I've been thinking about it lately, is, boy, the Muslims would think we are really polytheists. <laughs> <laughs> if they saw that, you know, we... But, you know, we're naive enough not to notice it. So our, our polytheism is just, oh, oh yeah, sure. <laughs> Lots of gods. Why not? <laughs> In fact, I'm going to read a poem later on, uh, which creeps up on that particular question. Uh, and it is um, it's in the voice of a 4th century A.D., a woman yogin, a yogini of North India, uh, uh, but it's a little bit of a critique of the Judeo-Christian tradition. <laughs> so bear with it. Don't take it, don't take it personally. If, if you might, probably nobody would anyway, but I don't know. Uh, I'll get to that. So tonight what we're going to do is I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit first about what I see as some of the immediate and current issues in environmental thought and in environmental uh, politics, uh, which involves the uh, uh, revisiting um, the definitions of some of the words we use again, uh, and uh, something which I'm always willing to do. And then I'm going to read uh, a selection of poems from my new volume of poetry, which is just out. It's called This Present Moment. Uh, it's only been out, you know, four or five days. Uh, I, I came here directly from Los Angeles. Uh, there's a nonstop flight direct to, Col to Colorado Springs from Los Angeles. You don't have to go through Denver. You know, so you know, if you ever want to do that, there it is. <laughs> uh, this was a huge event that was on the campus of the University of Southern California. Three or four thousand writers and publishers, 
booths, uh, dozens and dozens of little tents set up to look like teepees, uh, uh, and a uh, couple of talks that uh, I was involved in with people. Uh, and, and almost entirely West Coast oriented. Uh, I, I felt it was a little bit uh, narrow in that regard, but sponsored by the Los Angeles Times and the Los Angeles Times book editor, David uh, Ulan and I uh, had a wonderful conversation in public. Uh, and so I, I certainly recommend, uh, if you're interested in Southern California, which I wouldn't recommend at all, uh, <laughs> you would want to look at uh, books Recent books by David Ullin, uh, uh, who is, exp you know what the Los Angeles people, writers are beginning to do now? They're going beyond noir. And the prose writers, you know. Wow. Uh, noir, you have no idea, maybe you do, I have no idea how much noir has dominated the image of uh, Los Angeles, you know, plus a certain set of movies that uh, have kind of set the tone for uh, what we think of Southern California. Uh, so huge, such a huge place. Uh, okay, I won't say any more about that. Uh, so it's great to be here, and now I want to say a few words about, uh, uh, as I said, the word wild uh, to, to remind us because it is current again, if it ever stopped being current, in the debate that is going on right now between uh, two segments uh, of the environmental, uh, philosophical, and political community, the uh, what we call the breakthrough people uh, and the biodiversity people. Uh, the breakthrough people, which you may not have heard of because I hope you haven't heard of them, uh, they're, they're, they have uh, decided to cast their lot with uh, nuclear energy, uh, with pra practical uh, energy extraction, uh, with uh, industry wherever necessary, and the idea that being more scientific and more technological, rather than like, quote, going back to the land or um, eating organic vegetables, uh, is going to help us. Uh, it's going to help our uh, 21st century complex uh, uh, developed world type uh, economy uh, survive better. And they will say, and then, you know, being willing to write off uh, some uh, endangered species. You know, whoever has ever seen a Delta smelt, okay, we can do without that. Uh, there are a lot of little tiny creatures. Uh, this is a real problem that are uh, on the list that are listed. That uh, the environmentalist world itself has not come up really with a clear way of uh, talking about uh, how uh, such non-charismatic, non-easily visible beings uh, uh, are of value to uh, the dominant. Uh, economic and population society, namely Homo sapiens, uh, us, uh, right now. Uh, that, that is still part of the work of the whole environmentalist community. So the, bio, the uh, breakthrough point of view uh, is the pragmatic, uh, non-metaphysical, and not particularly organic point of view that says we've got to be practical and uh, deal with these things with the machinery, the science, uh, the technology that we have, and go on with it. And you know, probably the critical, uh, the really critical point in all of that is the question of nuclear power. More, uh, return to, uh, revise, uh, make more uh, nuclear power generating plants which Japan is talking about doing in a big way, uh, or not? And if not, what? Uh, there's no easy answer to that. Uh, the other side of the uh, story uh, is the uh, biodiversity people. Uh, I want to stop for a moment and say a few words about the word wild. This is a, an absolutely critical wor word in the um, 
English vocabulary. Uh, it always has had, and it continues to have, uh, two basic meanings uh, that we use almost unconsciously, interchangeably, uh, depending on context. Uh, one meaning uh, is wild and crazy, a wild party. We had a wild night. Uh, don't be too wild tonight. Uh, or, um, I was just on the phone with my sister-in-law and she just drives me wild, meaning angry and crazy again. So that's one meaning of wild that we all know. Uh, and then there's a kind of a midway meaning, meaning which is in the term wild and free. Uh, and we all want to be wild and free. Um, that sells cars. <laughs> Uh, uh, and the word wild uh, comes to the Germanic side of the uh, uh, English language, uh, goes back into Norse and into Swedish or German. Uh, but it's cognate with the uh, German word wald, W-A-L-D, which is used for woods, like Walden Pond. Uh, uh, but uh, you know, it has a complex set of, of um, usages and meanings as you go back into the uh, Germanic family of languages. And not all of them are, ne are, are negative at all, uh, or, or not socially negative. So then, uh, you know, if we take the other approach, uh, and I blocked all most, of, most of all of this out in the first chapter of my book, The, pra the Practice of the Wild. So I'm repeating in part what I have uh, talked about again uh, and, and adding a few new comments on it. Uh, wild also means orderly. It means stable. Uh, it means uh, uh, organized uh, and calm. Uh, and, and you might ask yourself why. Uh, how could it do that? Uh, so, uh, look at the term, a wild animal. What is a wild animal? A wild animal is an animal does, that does not need human beings to feed it. Uh, it has its own places to go, it knows what it wants, uh, and uh, uh, its reproduction is in its own terms, and uh, it doesn't require help from human beings to have intercourse and, produ and, and produce young. Now, there are some sheep and some pigs, and also really high quality racehorses, that need assistance you know, to reproduce uh, with artificial insemination. They are not wild. That is like one of the lines that you draw uh, between um, manipulated and uh, 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 created uh, organic behavior and the behavior of those beings uh, that can uh, live on in their own terms in this vast universe, which is a huge wild universe. The, the greatest um, wilderness area anywhere is the universe. <laughs> Isn't that a nice thought? <laughs> but there's not a whole lot of life in it, at least not as far as we know. Uh, and so we deal with the uh, life on planet Earth uh, and, um, you know, try to uh, figure out how, we, how do we adapt to this. Uh, so wild is a, is a term for a process, for not a process, for process. Uh, to be wild is to live within the process of uh, uh, organic, uh, the organic natural world um, going about uh, uh, its own way with pain or with pleasure, uh, with uh, survival or with death, uh, uh, making its way forward uh, and uh, sometimes seemingly heartless, sometimes seemingly beautiful. That's what we were born into, and that is the process that produced us, as far as I'm concerned. You know, there are other ways of talking about where human beings came from, but uh, I, I generally sign on to the idea that we are... Uh, 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 
evolutionary products of the same process as everything else on Earth uh, that uh, 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 is uh, um, uh, a living, living matter. The word nature, uh, which is related to the word native and the word uh, natal, of birth, uh, it, it, it has a fundamental meaning of that which is born, uh, and it is taken over in much of uh, Anglo-American culture uh, as a term to speak of the outdoors. I love nature. I love the outdoors. Uh, but in science, in the scientific language, uh, nature means the physical universe as we know it and study it, and any aspect of the physical nature that is available to our study is natural. Uh, and so from the standpoint of the physicist or the scientist, uh, nuclear power is natural. Uh, and so is pollution. Uh, all of that is natural because it follows its own uh, physical rules. Uh, uh, all we can do with it is decide that which uh, decide about that which we want to uh, uh, shunt to the side or not uh, encourage, uh, and that which we wish to live with and encourage. We do that in agriculture. We do that in orchardry. I do it with my little uh, orchard of uh, apple trees and pear trees. When I make choices as to uh, which limb I'm going to prune off. Uh, what spray I might put on for uh, 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 pear blight and um, uh, insects that eat apples. I don't do a whole lot with those trees. Uh, a little pruning here and there, uh, a, little, a little watering, a little bit of fertilizing, but that is playing with nature, you know, using nature's own terms, but it's another step uh, from uh, allowing a wild process to completely take take over and run it. Uh, there's an essay by um, Thoreau on that very topic, which is called Wild Apples. Uh, and he talks about the difference between the domesticated apples and the wild apples growing around the town of Concord, Massachusetts. And he simply wants to make a, uh, a little point in favor of at least respecting wild apples. Uh, even though you may not want to eat them because they're a little bit too sour, a little bit too bitter. But he says that's a good flavor. That's the flavor of the wild. Uh, so, you know, we, we need to take that to heart too. Uh, and the supernatural then remains a term uh, that you don't necessarily have to try to define, but uh, it refers to uh, that which is not subject to this vast physical a phenomenal world of natural process. Uh, and, and you can explore that, people do explore it in, va in various ways, uh, and uh, it goes uh, through the mind. Uh, and that is where, you know, some of the religious traditions are rooted, uh, to explore things that are not explored otherwise. But even there, in that territory, there are great lessons to be learned from the wild. Uh, and I will mention some of those lessons. Peyote, ayahuasca, things that you have heard of, or if not, you will eventually. <laughs> so we're, we're down at the argument right now uh, as to you know, what to do about these things. The argument is over uh, 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 the tar sands pipeline from Canada, uh, is over the resumption of nuclear power, uh, is over the question of uh, how to relate to and what to relate to in, in the new developments in China, where the, the, the official Chinese policy is we love nature. We've always loved nature. We think we are a part of nature, and it's true, they do. Uh, uh, but uh, we want to be number one or number one point B, uh, at least, in the world uh, of nations, and we don't want to be behind anymore, and we're going to uh, 
invest as much as we need to to become a, a, a fully developed number one country. After that, we will repair the damage we might have done to nature. <laughs> that would be great if it were possible, but the truth is, as we have already discovered in this country, with mitigations, you know, as a um, uh, alternative practice in regard to, say, certain developments, mitigations are more expensive than not doing it in the first place. Um, mitigations are very, very expensive things to do. And the Chinese will never be able to afford the mitigations that it will take to repair the damage that has already been done in the Chinese landscape. Uh, so instead, there's a good chance that uh, it'll just uh, crumble into a, uh, an unfortunate uh, situation with lots of poverty. Uh, one has to worry about that. Not just there, either, uh, but all over. Ah, uh, this is no fun to talk about. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm going to read poetry. Uh, and this is an odd book. It's divided into three sections, uh, Outriders, Locals, uh, and Ancestors uh, for the main poems, uh, and a little group of short poems uh, following uh, each of those three sections uh, that belong in some way with that section. Uh, and I have uh, made less effort with this book than I have in the past with some of my collections, of making them harmonious, uh, to some degree at least. Uh, these are uh, 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 poems that shoot off in different directions sometimes. And some of them are easy, easier to follow than others, but we'll see how it goes. After the reading part of it, I'm going to uh, uh, invite questions from the audience for a while. Uh, and do feel free to ask questions, and do feel free to ask <laughs> Difficult and embarrassing questions. They're the best kind. Uh, or not. Uh, and, and then after that, uh, we'll go out somewhere and sign books for a little while if anybody wants to do that. This is a, uh, starting out here now with a poem called Gnarly. G-N-A-R-L-Y, Gnarly. What a spelling. <laughs> Splitting 18 inch long rounds from a beetle kill Pine tree we felled, so it wouldn't smash a shed. With a borrowed splitter, Briggs and Stratton, 20 ton pressure, wedge on a piston push rod. Some rounds fall down, clean split in two. Some tough and thready, knotty, full of frass and galleries, gnarly, gnarly, my woman. She was sweet. <laughs> and she was gnarly. <laughs> the Earth's Wild Places. This is a poem I lost for 25 years. And then it turned up again somewhere in a pile of papers. And I'd forgotten about it. And I realized, oh, I wrote that. The earth's wild places, your eyes, your mouth and hands, the public highways, hands, the truck stops, semis rumbling in the corners, eyes like bank clerk's windows, foreign exchange. I love all the parts of your body. Friends hug your suburbs. Farmlands are given a nod but I know the path to your wilderness. It's not, like, it's not that I like it best, but we're almost always alone there, and it's scary, but also calm. And another poem that I lost for a long time 
Uh, and then, you know, you wouldn't believe where I found it. It was published in the New York Times. <laughs> uh, and the, uh, the guy who published it at least gave me credit for it. But I had forgotten where it was, and I hardly remembered even writing it. Because it was for my very first Macintosh. It's called uh, Why I Take Good Care of My Macintosh. Uh, and that was, you know, the very first Macintosh, or the second maybe, that came out that you could put a, a separately purchased hard drive under. Uh, and oh man, did they have a lot of storage space. <laughs> I was so excited by them. Because it broods under its hood like a perched falcon. Because it jumps like a skittish horse and sometimes throws me. Because it's pokey when cold. Because plastic is a sad, strong material that is charming to rodents. Because it is flighty. Because my mind flies into it through my fingers. Because it jumps forward and backward is an endless sniffer and searcher because its keys click like hail on boulders and it winks when it goes out and puts word heaps into hordes for me, dozens of pockets of gold under boulders in stream beds, identical seed pods strung on a vine or it stores bins of bolts and I lose them and find them again because whole worlds of writing can be boldly laid out and then highlighted and then vanish in a flash, <laughs> a delete. So it teaches of impermanence and pain. <laughs> because my computer and me are both brief in this world, both foolish, we have earthly fates. I've let it move in with me right inside the tent. It goes out with me every morning. We fill up our baskets, get back home, feel rich, relax. I throw it a scrap and it hums. <laughs> well, you can see where that poem leads. I got a dog <laughs> shortly after that. And then I didn't have to write poems to computers. <laughs> Anger, cattle, and Achilles. Two of my best friends quit speaking. One said his wrath was like that of Achilles. The three of us had traveled on the desert, awakened to birdsong and sunshine under ironwoods in a wadi south of the border. They both were herders, one with cattle and poems, the other with businesses and books. One almost died in a car crash, but slowly recovered. The other gave up all his friends, took refuge in a city, and studied the nuances of power. One of them I haven't seen in years. I met the other lately in the far back of a bar, musicians playing near the window, and he sweetly told me, listen to that music. The self we hold so dear will soon be gone. Uh, this is an extra question that you get a special prize for. <laughs> what was the name of the young woman uh, that Achilles was uh, suffering over and, and angry about? <laughs> right, Briseis. America wins again. <laughs> yeah. She was about 18, 
uh, the general of the Greeks had so much power, imagine that, that, there, that he could take the, the beloved girlfriend of his top hero, his top warrior, take her back, confiscate her, take her to his tent, and tell Achilles she's not yours anymore. Achilles could not even speak to him about it. But instead, he sulked in his tent for one month uh, and allowed a lot of Greeks to be killed in the daily battles with the uh, Trojans. And then finally he went back out and rejoined the battle. Uh, so that's the, uh, the little classical literature background to that. The rest takes place in the Southwest. <laughs> oh, boy. So now I'm into a little section here uh, that I call flights. Uh, and I have three of these sections of what I call flights uh, in this book. And the term I'm using here is the way flights is used when they um, sell expensive wines. You know, let's have a flight of, you know, wines from Provençal. Uh, and you get three different wines from somewhere in the south, in the south of France. Well, these are little poetic flights, I'd like to think. I don't know how poetic they are. But, but you know, this is little things to think about. This is, is new, old, New Mexican genetics. In Santa Fe, at the Palace of the Governors, this is the 18th century listing of the official genetic possibilities in New Mexico. Espanol, white. But maybe a mestizo, or anyone who has enough money and the right style. Indio, a Native American person. Mestizo, one Spanish and one Indian parent. Color quebrado, broken color. A rare category of three-way or more mix, white, African, Indio. Mulatto, white and African ancestry. Coyote, an Indio parent with mestizo parents. Lobo, one Indio plus one African parent. <laughs> Genisarro, which is a Spanish word for the Turkish word Janissary, uh, a special professional warrior class, refers to Plains Indian captives that are now sold and used as slaves. Why, California will never be like Tuscany. Uh, I, I spent a, a, a very useful f autumn a few years ago uh, in uh, Italy, uh, from Rome north to the Alps, and uh, you know took all of this in. Carol, my wife, was still alive then, and uh, we had a great time uh, realizing that, uh, well, California is just like another sort of Italy, except not. <laughs> There must have been huge oaks and pines, cedars, maybe even madrone, in Tuscany and Umbria long ago. A few centuries after the wood was gone, they began to build with brick and stone. Brick and stone farmhouses, solid, fireproof, with steel shutters and doors. But farming changed. 60,000 Vacant, solid, fireproof Italian farmhouses were on the market in the 1970s, scattered across the land. And 60,000 affluent foreigners, mostly British, to fix them, learn to cook, and write a book. <laughs> but in California, all the houses are wood. Roads pushed through, sewers dug, lines laid underground, hundreds of thousands made of strand board, sheetrock, plaster. 
they won't be here 200 years from now. They'll burn or rot. No handsome, solid second homes for a thousand year later, wealthy Melanesians or Eskimo artists and writers here. The oak and pine will soon return. Uh, you know the, uh, the American writer, he's been dead for some years now, Frank O'Hara, uh, who was of what they called the New York School. And he wrote wonderfully gossipy poems about downtown New York. Uh, he, worked, uh, he worked in the Museum of Modern Art as one of the curators. And uh, uh, then he was all over the scene in the evening with all his friends going up and down the alleys and the streets and the cafes. So I call this my um, Sierra Nevada Frank O'Hara poem. <laughs> it's, um, and it's dedicated actually to Chiura Obara. Uh, Obara sensei was a, a Japanese painter who uh, went to art school in Tokyo. And then in his early 20s, which would have been uh, in the 19-teens, uh, moved himself to, San, to, to the Bay Area uh, and became an artist uh, of, the, of California and ultimately became uh, uh, an art teacher and professor at the University of California uh, and uh, uh, ultimately did some remarkable uh, prints and watercolors of the Yosemite high country. Uh, and which are available in a book, Tiora Obata's Yosemite. Uh, the best art anybody has done about Yosemite. Uh, because the, uh, Euro the European inspired artists like Albert Bierstein, uh, when they came out to uh, do paintings of Yosemite in the late 19th century, uh, were still too influenced by uh, European sentimentalism uh, and over detailed and over coloring. They didn't have a good sense of what the basics were. Uh, and so Obata was a remarkable figure, now dead. Uh, so uh, this is called Tiura Obata's, Tiura Obata's Moon. Walking along, and you've got to imagine, you know, the way uh, Frank O'Hara talks about walking down Fifth Avenue. Walking along the noisy, busy North Lake Tahoe shoreline highway, 7 p.m., Early October, late dusk, rickety houses, old motels. On the lakeshore side of the street, a plastic orange fencing keeps out those who would try to get to the beach where they're building some whole new set of structures for the tourists. But I am at the Firelight Lodge, cramped for space and built around a pool that is empty. The clerk, a slender blonde with an accent, Polish, she says, but she's been here for many years and plans to stay. She's pretty. She knows the life of youth in the water and snow world of Lake Tahoe. Walking up on a sign that says Sancho's Tacos, a tiny storefront on a house. Off to the southwest, planet Venus, really bright. Sky so clear and purple violet tonight. Two pine trunks and that early crescent moon. The silhouetted ponderosa pine, mature and tall. I make my way into Sancho's. I hadn't planned to, but it's got a menu of more than tacos. Three youthful outdoor clad enthusiasts just back from some ridge top hike are laughing and drinking in the corner. And Sancho is an Anglo with a little beard and a sardonic smile. <laughs> I decide to go for the dinner, a whole cooked tilapia. Never saw that on a Mexican menu before. <laughs> Shades of Jack and Nancy Todd, some article 30 years ago on the freshwater fish tilapia, cousin of minnows, first from Africa, you could raise it in your greenhouse in tubs. The fish that might help us all back to the landers, 
get virtuous protein, maybe feed the whole world as well. Looking south toward the darkening lake and the murmur of trail gossip just at my back, it's the right place to be. The tilapia rice and bean dinner comes hot and it's good. Outside on the deck, the moon and Venus have shifted. I see Chiura Obara's woodblock of dusk at Yosemite, that dated 1930. The soaring blue cliff, the pines, the new moon. Uh, living as a uh, back to the lander, we were back to the landers once, uh, 1970 about. I came back from Japan in 1968 with my wife and my uh, two toddler sons, uh, and for the uh, uh, made the decision right away uh, to take advantage of some uh, land up in the uh, Sierra Nevada. And took my Japanese wife Masa Uehara up there and said. You know, what do you want to do? You want to be the wife of an instructor at an English department somewhere in California, or do you want to live up here? And she said, I choose to live here. Thank God I let her make that choice. <laughs> I would never have heard the end of it, you know. Uh, so, um, getting our, our act together, about a year later, we have moved up there and built a house, and I've been living there ever since, uh, 45, 46 years now, uh, and done a little improvements here and there, you know, put in indoor plumbing even. <laughs> uh, and we have all, uh, you know, had to come to terms with the logging industry, with the Forest Service, uh, and I myself have worked in the logging industry even before I ever did any of that. I was a choker setter up in Oregon for the Warm Springs Lumber Company back in the 50s. Um, good work to do after you get out of college. You know, it's, it's no good to just go out and get a good job. So um, I'm cruising. <laughs> I'm cruising uh, on my way down to the valley on Interstate 80, and this is a poem called Log Truck on the 80. Heading west down the 80, last slope before the valley, pass a loaded log truck, incense cedar with that stringy bark, mind watching lanes ahead, roams back to the mountains, on the left side back of me across the river, out toward forest hill, or back toward Duncan Canyon, or south to Sailor Meadows, dark forests pass in mind. I see a shady canyon, tangled gully, under old pine and fir, and there the fresh-cut stumps of cedar, someone napping with his chainsaw after lunch. Stories in the Night. Uh, we have been off the grid for 45 years. Uh, for the first 15 years, we got by with kerosene lamps and propane lamps. Uh, and then when the boys uh, were ready to go to high school and started getting uh, homework assignments, uh, I thought that maybe it would be better if they had electricity. Uh, so I started putting in, uh, I knew these things existed, I was just slow. Uh, you, know, you got some solar panels and batteries and then got a backup generator. Uh, and uh, every three or four years that went by, uh, we were adding on solar panels. We were getting better generators. Pretty soon we were almost you know, up to where you can do anything you want. Lots of solar panels and a big generator now, but still, uh, 
It's not like being on the grid. Uh, I never uh, took on being uh, having a standalone power, uh, a standalone electric system, uh, out of environmental virtue. Uh, it was, uh, believe me, uh, even though electricity is still is getting more expensive. Uh, if you can get the grid, get it. <laughs> and the time will soon enough come. Uh, when you'll have to figure out alternative ways to get your energy. But uh, uh, this is about, uh, this poem, uh, this poem is about losing your electricity one night and um, having to get back to work on the, the, the thing about um, the alternative electrical systems is they all take maintenance. You have to put water in the batteries, to, to, uh, a, a minor thing perhaps, but uh, you have to check things regularly. You have to, of course, change the oil in the big old generators. Uh, and things go wrong. Uh, you can't step away from it. And gradually, you learn. And also, you have to have a big manual right there. <laughs> and you have to try to read the manual once in a while. And I don't know who is able to read that. <laughs> Stories in the night. Note, in native California, the winter was storytelling time. Yesterday, I was working most of the day with a breakdown in the system. Generator one, generator two, old phased out generator three, the battery array, the big trace inverter, the solar panels. They had all stopped, cold early morning in the dark, back to the old days, Kerosene lamps, candles, and the wood stoves always work. The backup generator, the number three Honda, cycles wrong. Tricking inverter relays to start that starts the bulk charge. And the big green Onan, fueled by propane, wouldn't start. One time, turned out there was a clogged air cleaner, oil drops blowing back up from deep inside. I try to remember, machinery can always be fixed. But be ready to give up the plans that were made for the day. Go back to the manual. Call up friends who know more. Make some tea. Relax with your tools and your problems. Start enjoying the day. First 15 years we lived here, kerosene lamps. Heavy tile roof in the shade of a huge pre-contact black oak. Sherry, Siegfried's longtime woman friend and partner, is due at any time with a nine ton truck of three quarters inch crushed gravel. Wet dirt every winter eats up the rocks, keeping a few hard roads from dr for drenching water rains and melting snow takes planning, and you have to ditch them too. In 1962, going all through Kyushu, Japan, with Joanne, we walked around Hiroshima. Busy streets and coffee shops, green leafy trees and gardens, a lively place. But at Mount Aso, the great caldera in the center of the island of Kyushu, crater 30 miles across, saw sightseers from Nagasaki with that twisted, shiny, scarred, burn face of survivors from those days, and then read the English translation of Barefoot Gin, a graphic novel about the atomic weapon, the atomic bomb in Hiroshima uh, that um, is available in the United States, but nobody wants it. What got to me about the bomb was too much power. And then the temptation there to be the first, the first to become the emperor of the world, yet to be done. So change our course around, or there we tend. I could never be a Muslim. 
a Christian, or a Jew because of the Ten Commandments and how they fall short of moral rigor. <laughs> the Bible's shalt not kill leaves out the other realms of life. How could that be? What sort of world did they think this was? With no account for all of the wriggling feelers and the little fins, the spines, the slimy necks, eyes shiny in the night, paw prints in the snow. And that other thing, can't have no other God before me, like profound anxiety of power and jealousy and envy. <laughs> what sort of God is that? Worrying all the time. Plenty of little gods are waiting to begin their practice and learn who they are. In North India, 4th century AD, some Buddhist tantric teacher lady said, that god called Yahweh to the west, he's really something. But too bad, he has this nutty thing that he's creator of the world. <laughs> A delusion that could really set you back. <laughs> but returning to energy <laughs> I'll fix the Onan give up on number three it's too far gone and next time get a backup with a cast iron block and water cooling and a warranty good for centuries <laughs> put in a bunch more panels for the sun the old time people here in warm earth Lodges 30 feet across, burned pitchy pine wood slivers for their candles, snow after snow for all those centuries before. Lodge fire light and pitchy slivers burning don't take much light for stories in the night. I was uh, graciously introduced with uh, an elegant reference uh, to one of my huge Buddhist and uh, intellectual heroes, uh, Dogen Kigen, 12th century AD, uh, a philosopher and uh, priest. And uh, author of a, uh, a whole, uh, a wonderful collection of essays called the Shobo Genzo, the, Treasury of the True Law, which is being translated right now by a group of uh, uh, scholars in uh, East Asian Buddhism at Stanford under the direction of Carl Bielefeld. Uh, there is a one volume edition uh, from Counterpoint Press called Moon in a Dewdrop of um, uh, tentative translations from Dogen's essays, or actually they weren't essays, they were talks that he gave. That's all, and they were recorded, written down by uh, some of the people in the audience. Uh, so that little book is out and available. Uh, and in that book, uh, there is uh, 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 one uh, little talk he gave that is called The Painted Rice Cake, uh, in which he says, uh, you'll recognize this, uh, he says that uh, uh, some people think that uh, uh, that the menu is not the meal. Uh, some people think that a, a picture uh, uh, is not a reality. He said, but they're wrong. He said, the world is really just a painting. <laughs> and uh, uh, he said, and there is no uh, substitute, f there is nothing to fulfill your hunger like a painting of a rice cake. Much better than a rice cake. You know, that's, that's one of Dogen's many funny little weird things that he tries to bend your mind with. 
So I wrote a, I wrote a little poem about that, drawn from that. It's called Muchi's Persimmons. Muchi was the Zen monk name of a Chinese painter in the 12th century named Fa Chang, who was far more famous for painting uh, dragons and tigers. Apparently he did extremely well at that. But the Japanese uh, uh, were doing a lot of shopping back and forth between Osaka and uh, South China at that time. And they loved Muchi's small paintings of vegetables. So there's, um, there's a temple at Dai Tokuji in Kyoto that has this small collection of Muchi paintings of vegetables, vegetables and fruits. I mean, small, oops. They're only about, you know, uh, 12 by 14. Uh, they're not giant scrolls, but they're small scrolls. So this, is, this is, goes by the title of Muchi's Persimmons, a painting of persimmons. On a back wall down the hall, lit by a side glass door at my place, is the scroll of Mu Chi's great sumi painting persimmons. The wind waits 